All right, I'm going to now talk a little bit extra about the criterion function for the quantile regression model. So um, at the lecture, I, I divided this into three parts. First, intuitively motivating why the criterion function looks the way it does. Then I showed you the criterion function. And then uh, I went through at least part of the proof of why that minimizing that criterion function does actually give you the true parameters. So in some sense, you could just, if you, if you trust me, I could just give you that criterion function and say, trust me, if you minimize this one, you will get the true parameters for both of the two models that we've looked at, both the heteroscedasticity model and the, um, <clears throat> the heterogeneous parameter model. For both of them, minimizing that criterion function will give you the right betas. And the um, intuitive motivation goes like this. It's a, I'm saying that if you want to minimize in the expected squared residual, and you're trying to minimize that with some mu, then you solve that by setting mu equal to the expectation of y. And similarly, if you want to minimize the absolute deviation, the absolute residual, then you set mu equal to a median. Uh, so in, in more general terms, uh, if you want to m uh, minimize the residual uh, and you weight that residual a little bit more depending on whether it's on the positive or negative side, then what's going to come out of minimizing that is not going to be the median but one of the qu other quantiles. And when you do this conditional on x, it's all the same things. You just have the expectation is conditional on x and mu is a function of x. You still minimize it by setting it equal to the uh, expectation of y, now conditional on x. And same thing with the median, if you want to uh, minimize the expected, uh, conditionally expected um, absolute residual, then you set it equal to the conditional median. Okay, so for the criterion function, when you look in the book, this is the criterion function that Cameron Trevidi shows you. It has this form that you have it's a sum where the first sum is over the yi that's greater than or equal to xi beta, and the second part is where it's smaller than. And they actually have a mistake that I've repeated here. There's no sub tau on the beta, but there should be. <clears throat> and you have this asymmetric weighting where you weight the positive residuals with uh, tau, and you weight the negative residuals with 1 minus tau. And um, equivalently, we can write it as this, one big sum over all the observations, instead of just over some of the observations, of, and then an indicator for y being positive times something, plus an indicator for y, uh, y or sorry, y be greater than xi beta times something, plus an indicator for the opposite times something else. So either it's this contribution or it's this contribution, never both. So, what that says is when when the residual is, um, is positive, it's tau times uh, the residual, and when it's negative, it's tau, uh, one minus tau times uh, minus the residual, or the absolute value of the residual, which is negative in this case. So if we want to move towards the specification that I use in the slides and that everyone else uses in the literature, we need to get rid of the absolute values. We do that by saying that here in the first part, you're already multiplying by something that's zero if this thing in here is negative. So why not just, let's just remove the absolute value. In the second part, this thing in here is always going to be negative. So when we take the absolute value, we make it positive. So we have to multiply with minus one. We do that by reversing the order inside of this uh, parenthesis in front of it. And now it has a convenient form where we can take, uh, sorry, we can take this thing the residual outside of the parenthesis and then inside the parenthesis we're going to have tau is there in both of them and the minus one is only there when this thing is switched on so that's what we write here and times the residual and this whole thing here oops I'm for I've forgotten a sum over i this is sum over i of course so the criterion is the sum over i of these things and that thing is the, that's the check function. That's how we define the che check function. So that's the sense in which it's identical to the Cameron-Trevidi criterion function. This is the check function. 
and it looks like this puts asymmetric weight as you can see um, you will see Cameron Trevidi calling this a loss function the same thing on the Wikipedia article about re uh, quantile regression if you've looked at that and other people talk about loss functions loss functions are really our Q function this in this course the criterion functions we want to minimize them we want to minimize the loss in some sense which is the deviation between prediction model prediction and data and this is putting asymmetric weight so if we're estimating tau equal to 0.5 the median then this is going to put equal weight on both of them if tau is the 0.95 95th percentile then it puts much less weight on residuals on the negative side and much higher weight on residuals on the positive side so you're going to be putting this uh, zero part much further out which is what we want if we're estimating the 95th quantile percentile so this is the criterion function for one row and here you can see why I'm using tau and not q because q we use uppercase q for the full criterion function and lowercase q for uh, the criterion contribution for one row uh, data row for i uh, and that's what Cameron Trevidi sort of forgotten in that chapter so that's the criterion function uh, for the problem. Then I went on to go through some math in order to try and argue that the true parameters minimize this expectation. And uh, that can be hard to show in general. So, I, uh, so the proof here in the slides is just for the case when there's just one intercept. And I, I talked about uh, the only intercept, I called it, uh, or the intercept only model. What I mean is just that x beta is just equal to a, x is just a, a constant and there are no other x's. So then you're just estimating one number. And in that case, there are, there are no x's. So there's no y axis and x axis. There's just y's and you're estimating a quantile beta tau intercept. So you're just estimating a number for each quantile. So what is that? Well, actually, if you remember um, when I showed you the pictures of quantiles, here we go these are those numbers here we've estimated all of the quantiles of the normal distribution so those are the betas that we're estimating except then instead of, instead of having this smooth blue function which is the normal PDF we just have a data set so it's a little bit more noisy but that's that's the intercept only model there's just y let me go back again to the criterion function And um, proving that involves first rewriting this expectation here. And to do that, we need to convert it to an integral. And then we need to think carefully about this check function. In particular, we need to avoid this thing that happens here at zero. So we split into an integral over this region and an integral over that region where the function is nicely behaved. And once we've done that, we show that beta tau solves um, the, the correct first order conditions. So I'm not going to do that in the video now, but that's the intuition of how we prove that beta taus do minimize the criterion function. And of course, it gets harder if, you, if, you, uh, if you're not just doing it for an intercept only model. Um, it gets even harder. And solving those first order conditions is in particular quite uh, challenging. And as I said, um, we don't. I don't. I didn't talk much about identification here because really much of the discussion is similar to for OLS. So, for example, you cannot include the same variable twice. And you also cannot include, for example, two intercepts. You cannot identify those separately. And the arguments go along exactly the same lines as in OLS, except that instead of working based on a squared difference we're now working based on this check function of the the distance uh, in your mind you can just think of it for the median this is just the absolute residual so so that's how we argue about identification but there are no extra concerns about similar to in probit where we couldn't identify uh, the variance of the unobserved error term and so on and I show you these results here with estimates from different parameter uh, from different taus and uh, and together with a true function so remember as I said 
when we simulate data from this heterogeneous parameter model, we're getting a, a, a new beta for every individual because beta is now a function that takes tau as an input and returns a parameter vector. So we can, that's, so the red line is the truth here and we have many, many, many different taus. So we have many, many different parameters. It's a full function. And when we go and estimate the model, we can't do that infinitely many times, but we can estimate it. Here I've estimated it, I think, 19 times. And then we can just look at the difference between the true function and that, uh, and that uh, estimate. So here we're doing well. Down here you can see that there's a number for these taus. It looks like we're underestimating a little bit and then we're doing better down here towards the bottom. So that's what the parameter estimates is. You take a, a tau and then you estimate the model and you save that. And that's your uh, estimates. And I can show you that in uh, MATLAB here. So we've simulated data set here. <clears throat> As you see, then we can estimate first with OLS just to see what it looks like. It's always a good first step. I don't know why the graph is turning out so small. Strange. Um, and then we can estimate here. And we have to choose a tau when we want to estimate. But otherwise, as you can see, it looks the same. We have uh, we get some starting values. We, we set the, the model we want to use to be the quantile regression. Then we compute some starting values. And I've written a small procedure to pick some good starting values. Essentially, it's uh, what what that function does is it it looks at what are the percentiles here, what are the percentiles here, and then just takes the average slope as the starting value. And then we can uh, estimate the model. So here I do it for the uh, 0.95 and we get this estimate and we can uh, look at what theta hat tau is. It's this number 1.14 and 3.76 then we can pick a different uh, tau, 0.90. Then we get a different set of parameter estimates. You can see that the, the slope coefficient has gone down from 3.76 to uh, 2.59. So, so it's a slightly lower slope. Um, and you can also see that here, uh, as we take it down, let's take it down to point, uh, point 0 0.8 and rerun it, you can see that it moves down further here. Uh, we can take it even further down. Look at the look at for for the median. It comes even further down, and you can see the numbers all the way down to 0 0.44. So, so that's the sense in which you get a discrete set of estimates for every tau, even though in your data set, when we uh, when we simulated the data in the QREG alt here. Um, you can see from this statement here that the QREG alt class inherits everything from the QREG class, so all the, the criterion function and all of that. And the only thing that differs is the simulate dataset function. You can see that we're getting tau is n by 1, so there's a new parameter for every single observation. But what we're estimating uh, is we're estimating one parameter at a time. And what I showed you in the slides um, is exactly these parameter estimates for different values of tau. So I've just gone through them one at a time and put them together in a plot and shown along with them the true function beta, which in the QREG alt simulation here, here, can, here you can see how I take tau, which is uh, these uniform numbers, so just numbers between 0 and 1. Looks like this just uniformly distributed over 0 to 1 and then it calculates so you can see that the beta 1 coefficient which is the intercept is just 1 for every observation and beta 2 is a function of tau and I've actually added an extra uh, number here where I can scale it up and down a little bit so it's it's a chi-square inverse and then there's a uh, this extra term on it um, I multiply it by something more but it's just it's some function of tau, and if we uh, do a scatter plot of tau against beta 2, you can see that function here. This is what it looks like. You can see it maps the 10th percentile, they get almost zero coefficient, and if you have the 80th percentile, you get something like 1 or 2, 
and when you get up towards the highest percentiles you have very large coefficients. So in a sense that, or in these sense, this is the function that we're trying to estimate point-wise. So we pick a point and then we try and estimate what is the function here.